You ever served in an infantry unit, son? No, sir. Ever served in a forward area? No, sir. Ever put your life in another man's hands? Asked him to put his life in yours? No, sir. We follow orders, son. We follow orders or people die. It's that simple. Are we clear? Yes, sir. Are we clear? Crystal. Om Ajnana Timi Randhasya Dhyananjana Shalakaya Chakshur Unmilitam Yena Tasmai Shri Shri Gurave Namaha The following excerpt I'm about to read is from a quote from a pro prominent party man of the fabricated so-called ISKCON Confederation. Quote, it is very difficult for such persons to interact with ISKCON and its collective leadership. They, and he's referring here to Gaudi Amat, naturally wish to interact with ISKCON as they have been accustomed to interact in their own mutts as the sole acharya to whom everyone must defer. They cannot accept that their opinions and advice must be subjected to the collective decision-making power of the GBC." Unquote. Now kindly ask yourself the following question. What kind of genuine guru would accept such an arrangement? The guru, even if he is a Madhya Madhikari, is absolute. His disciple accepts his orders and his explanations as such. There is no value to the relationship unless and until this dynamic is both present and actuated. A genuine guru cannot have his orders countermanded by, quote, a collective decision-making power, unquote. Such institutionalism is the essence of the vitiated GBC, and never forget that that governing body has made and continues to make many wrong and disastrous decisions. Cooperation means that the genuine guru cooperates with the movement's governing body, if it is bona fide, in terms of its overall plans. However, none of this has been relevant because the vitiated GBC deviated from just days after Prabhupada left us. It was supposed to be a watchdog. Instead, it was the fox that gained easy entry into the ISKCON henhouse. Many thousands of bogus initiations now flood the world. This is a forbidden topic, a kind of third rail, but it needs to be confronted. The triumphalist ideology of the ISKCON party man combined with this tremendous expansion of newcomers, all with contaminated initiation beaches, has covered genuine Krishna consciousness for decades. And that needs to be brought to an end. Now here's some more claptrap from our party man. Quote, they, again referring to Gaudiya Mutt, they have insufficient ability to guide ISKCON. Just as the captain of a small sailing ship on a peaceful lake has insufficient ability to guide a fleet of high-powered modern warships into battle on the high seas, unquote. Wowzers. This is self-apotheosis on an institutional scale. To compare mutt gurus to small sailboats and on placid waters, and ISKCON gurus and the governing body to a fleet of huge warships 
engaged in world war on choppy seas is such tripe. If the bona fide guru, no matter how limited his ashram is in terms of numbers, if he and his save and his camp are both blessed by the Lord Vishnu because they're bona fide, that's completely acceptable. Here's another gem from our party man. Quote, but the main point is that in the future there would be a collective leadership and ISKCON members, even the most powerful, were expected to submit to it. Prabhupada set up this system during his life and encouraged his disciples to follow it. Undoubtedly, this is a difficult proposition." Unquote. Yeah, and made all the more difficult because the vitiated GBC he is glorifying has come up with and has imposed so many unauthorized concoctions on Prabhupada's disciples and followers over the years. Submit to what? Submit to a genuine guru and you're in good shape. Submit to good logic in the service of the guru's orders and shastra and you're also in good shape. Submit to a deviated collective leadership and you are heading straight toward that steep waterfall at the end of the rapids, a waterfall that slams with full fury upon huge jagged rocks lying below. Now let us dig a little bit deeper in today's party man propaganda. Quote, at the root of every ISKCON heresy lies the mutt mentality. The current Ritvik movement wants a Gaudiya mutt regime the single guru model, except that the single guru does not change. It remains Prabhupada for all time. The ISKCON members, those who have deserted ISKCON for various Gaudiya Mutt gurus, are also adhering to this Mutt system. They could not accept their guru's decision, he's referring to Prabhupada here, they could not accept their guru's decision that they go through the admittedly difficult process of submitting to a collective management system in ISKCON." Unquote. Now your host speaker does not completely disagree with this, especially the first sentence. However, I do mostly disagree with how so-called ISKCON and its party man applies it here. That first sentence is factual, but far heavier than what is indicated by him. He does not get into the repercussions to the extent that's merited in no small part because he's bamboozled by institutional loyalty. Ritvik is definitely rooted in the mud. Swami B. R. Sridhar in his will testified wrongly that Prabhupada set up a Ritvik system and that he, Swami B. R. Sridhar, was similarly doing so by appointing Govinda Maharaj, his chief disciple, as the next initiator, but he, Govinda Maharaj, would be initiating all newcomers as disciples, initiated disciples of Swami B. R. Sridhar. Your host speaker knew what was in that will, having been one of the first devotees to come into contact with it. Previous to that, I had already written a position paper, the first of its kind, by the way, against Ritvik. The crypto Ritvik entry in the Navadweep will appearing almost exactly one year before the Mississippi crew launched its initial Ritvik proposal, strongly indicates a mesoteric connection. The most important point, however, is that ISKCON heresy of the spring of 1978, that heresy was rooted also in mutt mentality. It was similar to what the Gaudiya GBC post Bhakti Siddhanta did in early 1937. It was not identical, but it was similar. Figur figuratively, the Mahamandala is Swami B. R. Sridhar's good son, so called Iskan, his rebel son, and Ritvik is the bastard. Now, freedom means to be able to say, that two plus two equals four. Freedom also means to be able to say what has actually happened to the Krishna consciousness movement. 
or to be more exact, to its facsimile. To describe what went down since the late 70s and why and who and what was responsible for it, that can never be popular. The Vaishnava Foundation is unconcerned with popularity. We are concerned about other things that are far more important. You need to understand that any genuine yoga system can never be popular, especially in this age. Popularity is emotional, transient, and chock full of opinions. The Greek philosophers called it vox, as distinguished from nous, which is intelligence. That's how we got this term vox populi, the opinion of the populace, which was dovetailed by Rousseau into the concocted political principle of a country's leaders being determined by popular vote. Now, Prabhupada took advantage of some early popularity. Indeed, your host speaker is directly a beneficiary of that. I was heavy into rock message music, the vast majority of which, with only one or two exceptional lines, centered around Western psychology. My roommate, during the year that I dropped out of university, handed me a copy of Be Here Now by Baba Ramdas. It was the first edition of what would eventually become 11. That first edition appendix consisted of biographies of gurus from India. Prabhupada's picture and biography was included and he was the only one that I was attracted to in the book. This happened to be my first venture into Eastern thought. None of the later editions contained the photo and biography of Prabhupada. It was intentionally removed although all the other yogis were again advertised in that book's appendix. This dovetails into a chief point, that Prabhupada, for as long as he could do so, wanted to remain popular with that small sliver of youth in the West which was inclined at that time toward genuine Eastern teachings. And he succeeded. He succeeded for a short time because that was all that he could have hoped to have achieved. His popularity soon diminished and eventually vanished everywhere. He knew that that would have to have become the case. The timing for his American arrival was perfect, but popularity is completely illusory, in and of itself without eternal value, and always fleeting. By his own admission, the hippies were Prabhupada's best customers. In a letter to Gaurav Sundar, dated July 13, 1969, Prabhupada wrote, quote, I think it is Krishna's desire that you would vacate the former building and go to the hippie quarters. Actually, the hippies are our best customers. Almost all of our important disciples have been recruited from that group, and you are also from that group. So actually we should try to serve the hippie group more than the others because there is great potency of recruiting Krishna consciousness devotees from them." Unquote. In a letter exactly one year later to Janani Vas, Prabhupada wrote, quote, Actually the younger generation, especially the hippies, are our best clients. So they are feeling very keenly the frustration of material life and it is our duty as Vaishnavs to be very sympathetic with them and give them this Krishna consciousness." Unquote. These are the people, the younger generation of the 60s and early 70s, who made Prabhupada popular amongst a limited section of America back in the day. The hippies were all over the map in terms of their values, interests, and attitudes. It was not at all a united movement. Many of them were atheistic and considered spiritual life to be only imaginary. Now, Prabhupada was of course ignored by that crowd, but some hippies liked him. Despite being degraded in dress and bathing habits and spiritually unqualified in many other ways, these people knew that Prabhupada represented the absolute truth. Just as importantly, the ISKCON movement was at that time running without deviation. It was plugged in, 
So even though there was some strife was caused here and there by leaders and their false egos, your bhakti seva, your service got through. Nevertheless, Prabhupada could foresee that the hippie religion would be a passing phenomenon. Its motif really had no place in Krishna consciousness. As such, after that initial stage, Prabhupada became unfavorable to it. In a letter to Sadama, he warned, quote, It will be another hippie edition. Gradually, the Krishna consciousness idea will evaporate. Another change. Another change. Every day, another change. Stop all this, unquote. As late as September 1975, Prabhupada wrote to Chayavana Swami that if enthusiasm in Krishna consciousness was not maintained, his devotees would, quote-unquote, return to hippie life. In other words, the short-term popularity Prabhupada received from the hippies had its utility. Utility is the principle. His base, however, always was and always must remain sincere and serious transcendentalists. We should be far more concerned about real values, such as uncompromising honesty, which is still missing in action in all of these so-called Vaishnav movements. And please note, all of them would have been thoroughly rejected by Prabhupada while he was physically manifest. As we have written elsewhere, Orwell said two plus two is four. Your host speaker goes further. We should also be allowed to say that one plus one equals two, not eleven. All of the governing body commissioners were instructed to come to Krishna Balaram on May 28, 1977, in order to be present for two important questions they were to receive, and they did receive, two important answers to those questions. One plus one equals two. The first question was, Prabhupada was asked whether or not initiations, initiations should be resumed at that time while he was still with us. Initiations had been stopped for some months during his prolonged illness, which culminated, by the way, in his disappearance less than six months later. His first answer to that first question was that initiations should be resumed. And just as was the case in 1970 onwards, these ceremonies should be conducted, should be conducted by leading secretaries. They were known as Ritviks. No one who received an initiation via a Ritvik conducting the ceremony ever believed that the Ritvik was his initiating guru. So that was one question and it was clearly answered. The second question was about newcomers being initiated after Prabhupada in the words of the inquirer was quote no longer with us unquote. Now Prabhupada did not answer this one immediately, of course, because he answered the initial query first. That initial answer was Ritviks were to resume the previous ceremonial way. However, Prabhupada did answer the second question soon thereafter, and he also answered it concisely and clearly, quote, when I order you become guru, he becomes regular guru, that's all. He becomes disciple of my disciple, that's it." Unquote. This was his answer to the second question, and it introduced the term regular guru. The term may have been new in and of itself, but the concept was not at all new. Prabhupada had written about it repeatedly in previous years, even in the early years. Let me give you some examples. Quote, he must not take on unlimited disciples. This means that a candidate who has successfully followed the first 12 items can also become a spiritual master himself, just as a student becomes a monitor in class 
with a limited number of disciples, unquote. As most of you know, this excerpt is from Easy Journey to Other Planets. Now consider another excerpt from a letter to one of his first initiated disciples. Quote, Generally, the spiritual master comes from the group of such eternal associates of the Lord. But anyone who follows the principles of such ever-liberated persons is as good as the above-mentioned group. The gurus from nature study are accepted as such on the principle that an elevated person in Krishna consciousness does not accept anyone as a disciple, but he accepts everyone as expansion of his guru." Unquote. This was a 1968 letter to Janardhan. In it, we understand that one who follows the principles of a liberated Acharya is as good as that liberated Acharya, certainly in terms of giving an, a genuine initiation. Those who, under such bhakti regulation, follow those principles are, in the words of this excerpt, quote-unquote, from nature's study. This means that they're still being tested and studied by the Maya. When someone is following these principles and still under the scrutiny of material nature, he can only be a guru under regulation because he is still engaged in following the regulative principles of vidhi sadhana bhakti. Sounds like a regular guru, doesn't it? Then there's this from the purport of a Bhagavatam verse. Quote, the second class devotee accepts disciples from the section of third class devotees or non devotees. Unquote. Now, to rationalize that this refers only to Shiksha gurus is to misinterpret it. It most certainly also refers to Diksha gurus, verifying the statement from Easy Journey to Other Planets, verifying the expert excerpt to Janardhan, and verifying. verifying the introduction to the term regular guru by his divine grace at Krishna Balaram in May of 1977. The fact is that it was the duty of the governing body to know what regular guru meant, especially in the context that Prabhupada intended it. All of the governing body members present dropped the ball, failing to follow up Instead of 1 plus 1 equaling 2, they wound up removing the add sign between the single numbers, joined the single numbers, and converted 1 plus 1 into 11. The pretender Mahabhagavats had no authority, particularly due to the fact that none of them were anywhere close to possessing complete purity and realization. Just as importantly, Prabhupada did not authorize them to imitate Uttamadakari. He only authorized regular guru, that's all. Just as importantly, he did not officially name or recognize any of his initiated disciples as having even attained that status. Now, is Maya whispering to you, well, how could those eleven men not at least been Madhyams? Well, to answer that doubt. Just look what they did! Could any Madhyam Adhikari or even a genuine Kanishta, could any serious and sincere de devotee have allowed himself to be part of such an egregious zonal Acharya scam? Tatvamasi Plato wrote that the most important qualities of any good leader are truthfulness and expertise. You will find neither of these in any of the ISKCON governing body commissioners. They were all and continue to be dishonest, clumsy, and negligent. Plato also wrote that a good leader would never for a moment willingly tolerate falsity. Yet that's just what the vitiated GBC did back in the late 70s. It pushed the big lie that Prabhupada had appointed 11 men as Diksha Gurus, which he never did. 
That big lie was buttressed by the rationalization that Prabhupada's appointment of 11 Ritviks meant that they were automatically to be recognized as initiating spiritual masters after his departure. These two big lies were wrapped into one and every GBC was implicated in that prevarication. Why? Because none of them tried to stop it. Plato also wrote that the sur surest signs of a bad leader are narcissism and self-indulgence. The eleven pretender Mahabhagavats, all governing body commissioners themselves, all beneficiaries of that unaccountable Acharya board, a governing body within the governing body. They were all self-absorbed. How could they have the audacity and temerity and chutzpah to accept worship as God-realized souls? The answer is because they were all mega-narcissists. There are countless incidents depicting their self-indulgence which flourished because there was not a scintilla, scintilla of honesty or humility present in any of them, although they were expert at the pretense of humility whenever some occasion arrived requiring it. And they were all, initially only, initially, expert at imitating spiritual master, although that broke down rather quickly, didn't it? Now let us consider this May 30th, 1976 excerpt from a Maroon Conversation in Honolulu. This is Prabhupada speaking. Quote, The tendency for becoming guru is there, but after all, every one of you should become guru. But why immature attempt? That is my question. Every one will become guru when he is expert disciple. But why this immature attempt? Guru is not a thing, imitation. When one is mature, he becomes guru automatically. What is your answer to this? They're making some attempt to become guru? I am training all of you to become guru in the future. Now, the Krishna consciousness movement, the properties and everything, I will not take with me. They will remain where they are. It requires very mature treatment but there has been some attempt to become guru immediately. Am I correct or not? You have to follow the parampara system, the order. That is guru. Not that I declare myself as guru. No, that is not guru. Guru is he who has strictly followed the order of the spiritual master. He can become guru. Otherwise, it will be spoiled. Artificial attempt is not good." Unquote. Then in this room conversation in Honolulu, one of his leading secretaries present there asked the following question, quote, I'm just trying to clarify, I don't want to offend anybody, but no disciple of yours should call himself Diksha Guru or Shiksha Guru. Am I right? Unquote. To which Prabhupada answered, quote, Well, everyone is engaged to become Shiksha Guru but one should become perfect. The attempt is what is called probationer. When probationer period is finished, then he is naturally automatically bona fide guru, not in the probationer period. That is immature attempt. That will be failure. Chaitanya Mahaprabhu said, but by my order, so all my disciples are expected to become Shiksha Guru on my order, not by his own order. Otherwise, it will be artificial attempt, and that kind of guru will not help." Unquote. Now, admittedly, the overall reference in this excerpt from the room conversation is to Shiksha Guru. The dumbing down of Shiksha Guru proceeds apace, and the whole make show continues to be bogus. Prabhupada never gave the order for any of his disciples. He never specifically named, appointed, or recognized any of them to be initiating guru. That same principle, by the way, applies to Shiksha Guru. 
there has for years been this nonsense propaganda that one requires to secure the no objection certificate in order to become Diksha Guru, but all other ISKCON God Brothers are automatically Shiksha Gurus. This propaganda is propped up both from above and below. It is a tactic that fits well into the overall strategy of the fabricated so-called ISKCON Confederation, but like everything else in that cult, it has no substance. But let us now segue to the more important topic of Diksha Guru since it was also referred to in that room conversation. In May of 1977, Prabhupada said, Regular Guru, that's all. In Honolulu, almost exactly one year earlier, everything in that long excerpt from the room conversation applies to regular Guru. Immature attempt? Are you kidding me? Of course it was! Were any of the eleven expert disciples? Of course not. If they were, why did their attempt at the Zonal Acharya Pretender Mahabhagavat scam crash and burn in less than a decade? Guru is not imitation, but what did the one plus one equals eleven crowd do? They all imitated the Acharya, that's what. They were all envious of Prabhupada and wanted to be like him, so they imitated him. And the whole debacle murdered his Hare Krishna movement of Krishna consciousness. They never got past the probationary stage. Instead, they attempted to become guru immediately. And not just Shiksha guru either. They falsely declared themselves to be Uttama Atikaris and the GBC rubber stamped it. The institution instituted it. It was imposed. It was opposed from above and buttressed from below by so many foolish newcomers. It was all an illusory display, part of the relative world, but disguised as absolute. It was an artificial attempt, and in the words of Prabhupada from that room conversation in Honolulu, it was not at all good. Indeed, the fact of the matter is that it was extremely evil. It was a failure, but that hasn't been recognized. It's not even been recognized by now. Why? Because thousands of kickmes, fools, zealots, space cadets, and similar aberrated personalities all consider themselves to be initiated by either those great pretenders or by the downline that came after them. You need to understand that Krishna consciousness is awakened consciousness. Krishna consciousness, when it's genuine, impedes man's barbarity to his fellow man and a repeat of the ultra-violence that has gone down in the Western world since 1917. Without genuine Krishna consciousness, our transhuman future will not be able to stop the abolition of man and will instead result in an unprecedented kind of planetary empire governed by a technocracy. It will be egged on from behind the curtain by covert theocrats, the whole scheme becoming more obvious as time drags on. Now, digital life will not stop this gl downward glide path, but will instead serve to augment it. The only one world dream worth realizing is one where honesty, especially in relation to the root issues, that honesty must be part of its bedrock. That is not at all present in so-called ISKCON, and it never will be. The choices that we make now will determine a course for centuries, a course that will be dominated otherwise by unspeakable atrocities if the rascals posing themselves as Krishna conscious are allowed to continue to swell. Confronting the people who are falsely initiated, who in utter delusion think that they are genuinely initiated, is imperative. Without clear and concerted action, without knowledge, and especially without courage, 
This confrontation cannot be made, but it has to be done. The promise of a utopian technocracy guided by the fabricated so-called ISKCON Confederation from behind the curtain must be eschewed by every sincere and serious transcendentalist before it gains any real traction because it has only very small traction at this point. Otherwise, if it is not confronted, today's descending octave will in due course come under the full control of perverse technocratic mletches, so-called human beings who are actually beasts. With the encouragement and guidance of imitation spiritual life, they will convert future generations into slaves. Do not think for a moment that this is not possible. Not only is it possible, but without a genuine rejuvenation of Krishna consciousness, without a revival of honest Krishna consciousness, it is a certainty. Contaminated blog sites or daily online newsletters will not necessarily help us now. Well, there's the solar smorgasbord for the last decade and a half, an online daily loaded with agendas shrouded by unclear presentations that only superficially appear to be against the institutional deviation when in point of fact it is compromised with it. Through the power of diversion, that website, that online daily, accomplishes the exact opposite of what you think its, it's, in, its intention is. Now, we haven't covered all the Mayaka factors, obviously, but such is not our intent. Instead, let us focus upon these thousands of newly initiated bhaktas and bhaktans who populate the fabricated so-called ISKCON, keeping it a going concern. Are any of them initiated? The answer is this. They all are. Do not be unduly alarmed when your host speaker presents this answer because they are all initiated by contaminated beaches. Your host speaker's intention is to reestablish the truth. There can be no real virtue without it. The big lie from the spring of 1978 has not been uprooted. It carries on in a disguised form. It carries on because it is assisted from above in the form of the vitiated GBC and its institutional gurus. Internet sites and blogs, with few exceptions, also assist it in various ways. It is buttressed from the side by Ritvik, which serves so-called ISKCON as a perfect foil, as well as by Neomut. It is buttressed from the outside by anti-Vedic Western culture in general and its Malecha Tharma organized religions in particular. However, it is propped up from underneath as well. None of the post-1977 newcomers has received the Bhakti Lata Bij, although they all think they have it. If the question is asked, as to why a handful of them still appear to strongly engage in bhakti practices, the answer is fundamental. They have some kind of link to their Shiksha Guru, the last Uttamadakari representative in our Parampara, Srila Prabhupada. That link is not an initiation link because they cannot be initiated by him, but it's a link of faith. Ironically, Iskan newcomers are better off than the Ritviks because the ISKCON people do not claim that they've been initiated by a non-manifest guru. The Ritviks are also dedicated to Srila Prabhupada, so both sets are superior to anything that Neomut is producing. However, the Ritviks wrongly insist that they are initiated by Prabhupada. Your host speaker's intention and judgment here is for the purpose of the transcendental. Dishonesty and lies cannot be allowed to perpetuate the institutional spell of ignorance oppressing us. Genuine Krishna consciousness must be free from that. But what has gone down in so-called ISKCON for the past 40 plus years will lead to another debacle. If we allow that to transpire, 
when so-called ISKCON marries the technocracy, such a postmodern inquisition will be far worse than what Western Europe experienced in the 14th century. If the basic math is wrong, all the window dressing that follows it will still continue to produce wrong results. The truth is that a bogus guru cannot give a bona fide initiation. Kindly let me, let me repeat that. A bogus guru cannot give a bona fide initiation. The 11 great pretenders were all bogus gurus. They opened their click up to some degree. After all, they were all Americans and the Krishna movement is centered in India and three more were added in the early 80s. Two of them were native born Indians and at least one of them engaged in heavy duty politics in order to secure his inclusion. I personally witnessed that. All three of those also accepted Uttamadakari worship. In essence, the deviation was maintained by this change and their promotion renewed the scam, keeping it viable for a longer time. The Acharya board at that time remained the central power. By the early 80s, there were now 12 or so gurus accepting Mahabhagavat worship as Hunksadut and Jayatirtha were each separately ostracized by May of 1983. Then in the mid 80s, the scandals began surfacing in a very big way. The Acharya board, the center, could not hold. The whole ISKCON movement was in danger of cratering. So in the words of Mick Jagger, it was a time for a change. That change was ushered in by Professor Blueblood, but the root deviation was not at all dealt with by it. The root deviation was locked in at that time because the second transformation of the mid-80s covered all the real issues much more effectively than the first transformation did. And what did that change culminate in? It culminated in institutionalism, the prominence of the ISKCON party man. So let us return to our party man who we quoted in the beginning and his posted blog full of quotes representing his cult. Quote, could such a guru accept the collective decision of ISKCON that, Maharaj, your preaching on this point of philosophy differs from that uh, of Prabhupada, so kindly do not mention it anymore in your classes. Or could such a guru accept a decision that, Maharaj, this year we would kindly like you to confine your preaching to this part of the world, unquote. The zonal scheme has been debunked and rejected for decades. Or has it? Here our party man doubts that a Gaudiya Mutt guru could accept a restriction not to preach in certain sectors of the world. As some of you probably know, the vitiated GVC has recently cordoned off so-called Deshakalapatra zones for its own. Such territorial demarcations are nothing more than mini-zones, which means Zonal Acharya now is making a backdoor comeback. If some Gaudiya Mutt guru rejects this version, and in point of fact they all do, then so-called ISKCON cannot accept him, all theoretical of course, but the quote tips the hand of party men mentality. There are contradictions embedded in the question as to why a Mutt guru can or cannot be accepted in so-called ISKCON. So far, none have been accepted, but Swami B.R. Sridhar was accepted back in the day, big time. That's the contradiction which sits atop the ISKCON pyramid of contradictions. Now check out this jewel from the party man. Quote, we should not manifest animosity toward any of the Gaudiya Mutt gurus. We should maintain a respectful but distant relationship. If they accept certain conditions offered by the GBC, we should allow them to speak as long as our gurus and senior devotees are given similar privileges." Unquote. 
Now he calls them gurus, meaning he accepts their sangha as bona fide and their gurus as bona fide, at least within that sangha. This, in effect, makes the guru relative. But that should come not as a surprise to anyone. He says that everyone in so-called ISKCON should respect the mat gurus but keep a distance from them. How can they be respected if they are not also accepted as gurus qualified to preach Krishna consciousness anywhere and everywhere? This must also include inside ISKCON temples. However, they can only be allowed to speak in the ISKCON Sangha if they meet GBC conditions and the mat also allows ISKCON gurus similar facility in their Sangha, which it currently does not. The excerpt continues, quote, For the long term, we should pursue the goal of integrating all Gaudiya Mats into ISKCON, along with their former ISKCON members. This will depend upon ISKCON maintaining its commitment to a unified, dynamic, worldwide preaching mission under the authority of collective leadership, the quality of which should continually improve." Unquote. The goal of so-called ISKCON relative to Gaudi Mutt is to amalgamate it under the auspices of its, of ISKCON's concocted collective leadership paradigm, which has over the years failed to properly maintain Prabhupada's movement with no close second. Institutionalism is the cult's supreme value and our party man hews to it. They value institutional unity over everything else. They believe that all their many quote-unquote mistakes will continually be able to be overcome. The old improvise, adapt, and overcome mentality by their fix-it-as-you-go approach. However, their so-called mistakes were not ex mistakes. They're all in another category, and they continue to be in that category. They're not mistakes. They're deviations. In summation, the so-called authority of the vitiated GBC, the power node of the fabricated so-called ISKCON confederation, has no spiritual or devotional legitimacy at all. Its power may or may not expand in the short term, but its quality can never, quote unquote, continually improve because it does not possess at root anything other than deviation, which works to cover Krishna consciousness in the name of spreading it. The irreconcilable conflict centering around the origination of the jiva should not be simply seen as a minor difference between sanghas. In practice, such a compromise will facilitate so-called ISKCON accepting mutgurus as long as they agree to work within the ISKCON collective management paradigm. How obviously contradictory that is. Philosophical differences on something as essential as the jiva's origination are poo-pooed. Such a Gaudiya Mutt guru would continue to believe in and push that up a Siddhanta, but he could not preach it in so-called ISKCON, that's all. Only persons with imitation bijas could possibly accept this kind of concocted arrangement, and you should not allow yourself to be amongst them. Sadeva Samya